you're looking for recommendations. And now I, hopefully you understand why it seems a little silly to give recommendation without knowing much more about the conditions what we have. So you might recommend rhododendrons because you love rhododendrons, but if the soil pH is not right, they will not live. Um, and now we're moving on to the plant selection and arrangement. Uh, usually, uh, yeah, this is something that you might see frequently around here, whether it's a house for sale or a house that was just recently purchased and the new owners moved in. Many times the plants are, the existing plants, old plants are ripped out and there's some narrow strip planted along the uh, walkway or right along the house. And uh, this is not the type of gardening that I'm talking about. Uh, it's that doesn't say that you can't start with small plants when you're planting your garden, but you have to take into consideration what they are going to look like later. This is another example of what I'm not talking about. I don't like using mulch. You probably, if, if you know me, you know that I'm not a fan of mulch and placing plants far apart with mulch fields in between are not a good way of doing gardening. Uh, so this picture actually came from Thomas Rainer. He is one of the co-authors of my favorite book. And I'll show you some books at the end of the presentation. If not, remind me and I can show you what my favorite books are. Uh, and if we were in the library today, I would have bought the books up and uh, you could have uh, looked into them. Um, so what I would like to talk about more is uh, what nature intended to be like, how plants grow in the, when we let them be. Uh, so this is uh, inspiration from nature and you can see that there's not a lot of mulch uh, or any, anything that looks like mulch. There's a big uh, uh, log and most of the soil is covered with plants and there's some debris of leaf litter, but uh, there's not a lot of bare soil. And this is actually a part of uh, in our a part of my shade garden at our house, and you can see it's a similar idea. There's a little bit more bare soil here because I keep changing things, but uh, the idea is to cover the ground with plants so you don't have to mulch or you have to mulch very little. And this garden is almost entirely native plants, and you can see that the plants are growing in kind of an intermingled. Uh, uh, arrangement. They're not necessary. They are somewhat in groups, but they're uh, mixing. And this is actually in the spring. It was taken in April, so around this time of the year. Um, so let's go through how we're selecting plants. And this doesn't mean that you cannot have your favorite plants and you can, you know, go and take pictures and, you know, when you're going out for a walk and you see a plant that you like and and try to figure out what it is. That's, there's nothing wrong with that. I do get pictures like that from clients that like, what is this plant? I would like one of these. But you need to make sure that your plant that you're putting in your yard is suitable for the site conditions. Uh, it has to be the right plant for the condition that we, I talked about before, the soil moisture, the light, um, whether it's clay soil or sandy soil, which mostly here, you will get a lot of clay soil. Um, so you have to make sure that the plant is suitable for the site condition. So you can start with a uh, basically a plant list. So start with your favorite plants, make sure that they fit the bill, they fit the conditions that you have. And then after that, you wanna look at mature height and also the width or the spread of the plant. Because uh, we might buy a tiny one gallon plant, maybe a four foot tree, but we, those plants will get bigger and bigger over time, especially if we let them be and if they have the right conditions. So we want to plant them in a place where they have the room to grow into what they should look like in nature. So look at the height, the spread, and when you're spacing plants, uh, perennials are usually placed between a foot and two feet apart, unless something like a Baptisia that will get bigger. And those I would place further apart. For shrubs, if a shrub will be about three, four foot wide, I probably wouldn't plant them closer than two feet, maybe three feet. If you have a viburnum that can get, or a 
oak leaf hydrangea that can get eight feet wide or bigger, probably planting them five feet uh, apart is probably the closest you should put them. And also you have to make sure that you have space between the building or fence and the plant. So uh, just keep in mind if you have a oak leaf hydrangea eight foot wide, you want to plant it at least five foot from this side of the house. Next, uh, color and bloom time. This is probably one of the most obvious one. In fact, there's some books in the library that are talking about just that, how you combine colors, what are the flowers and when they bloom. Uh, and I would also add the, uh, you take into consideration what plants are evergreen. And there are some perennials that will keep the leaves and look nice over the winter. And I will talk about their importance later. Uh, Next, and these last two uh, import, uh, things are usually the things that we don't think about naturally, is the one is the plant structure and root type. If you're thinking about how plants grow in nature, there's some plants that have tap roots, some plants have fibrous roots, and they grow together, so they're using up resources and sharing resources, but they're not fighting with each other. Basically, they're not competing for the same resources there. They can share the same space, but they're not exactly in the same space. Um, so if we're planting a bunch of coneflowers next to each other, they all have the same root structure and they're competing with each other for, for the resources. And they probably will be floppy too. If you plant them with other things in between, then they will do better. Uh, and the last uh, important uh, consideration is the plant's sociability and the method of uh, dispersal. So if you have a plant that will spread with runners, you want to make sure that you take that into consideration when you're designing. So basically don't put bullies next to uh, big competitors. Just like in kindergarten, you kind of want to balance things out. You don't want to plant things that are really strong competitors with things that are not. Um, on the other hand, you can take into consideration that if you have some really bad invasive plants that you want to compete with and have something, then you might want to look at a native plant and find something that will be equally competitive and help uh, you outcompete the invasive plant. One of the examples that I heard and I haven't tried yet is like the lesser salandine that's blooming everywhere now. You can try to plant Pecker aurea, the golden ragwort, and that's supposed to be a better competitor than the um, salandine. So that might be something worth trying. Um, and just briefly, this is not a native plant presentation, but I would like to encourage everybody to plant native plants primarily. Uh, I love my hellebores, I love my uh, camellias, but as the, there are a lot of uh, um, plant animals that will rely on only one species or a small group of species. So we need to plant natives as much as possible so we can support those specialists and uh, because the generalists can survive anyhow. So we don't have to worry about the honeybees that are non-native and they can, they're generalists and they can survive with any flowers. Uh, but we have one bee that feeds on the spring beauty. We might wanna have more spring beauty and we want to have golden rods and other native plants. What are you doing? Um, um, Next, uh, this is probably not something that most people would consider naturally. This came from uh, Claudie West, Planting in a Post-Wild World book. Um, and I also did a two-day training with her. Uh, this is how we break down, uh, how we can group plants by function, what they, the function they fill in in the landscape. Um, we have structural plants, and that should be only about 15% of the landscape. Uh, the examples would be switchgrass or liatrius that will fill the space and they have really strong structural that will stay the same most of the year. I mean, this, uh, these plant uh, selections were for uh, more metal type planting, but if you're looking at more a full, like a savanna type planting, what you have 
more slightly at your house with trees and shrubs. Trees and shrubs obviously would be structural plants because they are just present most of, all of the year and you can see their structure. Uh, next one, those are the plants that sell themselves in the nurseries, the seasonal theme plants. Uh, and you should only have about 25-40% of your garden uh, filled with these. These are the things that nurseries sell when they're in bloom because people just love buying them. So these are the esters, the tick seeds, any of the big flowery plants uh, that we just love to buy. And then the next two groups, those are the ones that seem to be forgotten and people don't really use them or don't use them the way they could be used. Uh, ground covering plants, we should have close to 50% of our plants, ground covering plants. These are the workhorses of the garden. These are the things that fill in uh, space, cover the ground. As I said, I don't like mulch. I like to use plants to cover the ground. I think it's less work, more uh, fun, uh, and it's also less expensive on long-term. Uh, these are the plants that will not look good in a pot, most likely, uh, except maybe the floral bells. But the sedges, a lot of the retail nurseries don't even sell these because they can't sell them because people don't know what they're looking for. Um, they're not looking for these plants. And these are things that you should buy by the dozen or hundreds. Uh, good examples, and I'll show you pictures of what they look like. There's the sedges wild ginger, coral bells kind of could fill in with seasonal theme and uh, ground covering plants. These are the ones that uh, keep the weeds at bay. Uh, so just keep in mind that you need to do those, but not everything has to be a showcase. Not every plant in the garden has to be a uh, yeah, specimen plant. And then the last group, this is a small group. You only need a, a you know, few percent in the garden. These are the filler plants. These are usually short-lived plants, annuals or biennials, uh, like columbine. You plant it once and then it might disappear, but it might show up in a different place in your garden or cardinal flower. These are intended to be there so that they spread their seeds. And if there's any disturbance in the garden, um, ideally, these are the things that would grow in cell weeds. So you have the seed bank there and they could fill in the garden uh, if there's any, if there's a dog digging a hole or something else, then ho hopefully these seeds will start germinating and fill in the space. Um, and, the, and this is just a, a you know, snippet from one of my spreadsheets that I had when I was designing our meadow planting, which you'll see photos of later in the presentation. Um, this is something that you could do, but you can just do it on a sheet of paper and just write down the list of the plants, the sizes, how tall they get, what time they bloom and the bloom color, also what uh, the sociability, whether they should be planted as single plants or do you wanna plant them in a group or a large, big group, smaller group, or uh, and what kind of uh, role they fill, whether they're, um, you know, filler plants or ground covering plants or seasonal theme plants. So this is just one way to do it. Uh, let's go back to what the design inspiration is. This is how plants grow in nature. You can see if you're good with native plants, you might be able to recognize some of these. There's wood ester in here. Um, let me see if I can get my pointer here. So this is a wood aster. Obviously, there's violets here. There's jack in the pulpit. There's some sedges. There's all different things. And they're not in any particular grouping. They're just growing intermingled all together. Uh, but the traditional garden designs look like this. So uh, you usually have bubbles of plants, and they're not intermingled in any way. So that's not really describing what plants wants to do, want to do. Uh, so you can look at another way of drawing a design. This is from uh, Roy Diblick's uh, No Maintenance Garden book. And he has some matrices. Um, 
And then you can repeat this little pattern and fill in a large amount, a large space with just one design matrix with a small piece and you just repeat it and rotate it and you can do a large design with that. And this seems to be fairly simple because you can use a, a graph paper and just uh, draw out your plans, space them a foot, two feet apart. And that is fairly simple. Uh, this one looks a lot more complex and uh, maybe hard to understand. Uh, this is Pete Adolf's uh, design. Uh, what bring, binds the whole thing together is having a matrix. Let's see, so you can see here. Uh, so they ha he has a matrix of uh, grasses and corn, uh, corn flour. Mostly grass, 65% grasses, then 25% uh corn flour so the matrix the ground covering plant in this case would be the uh sparables and then you have the corn flour giving the color and then you have uh i guess it's the uh sea holly uh gives color so that's the background that's the basis for everything and then in between the in that matrix there's a bunch of other plants mixed in but you have different shapes but you have the repetition of the plants so you have sedum is here and then there's another group here and there's another one here so you have a repetition of the elements which will create the unity in the design so even though it seemed complex to look at it first and i really recommend you getting any of uh, his books because they're really nice uh, have good ideas and it's really good to read through but it once you get used to looking at it it's not quite as complex as it seems first um, and then the other thing that can help draw out your ideas is designing in layers if you're uh yeah you know, designing and you have some trees and shrubs and perennials it might be too much to put everything on one sheet of paper you can have multiple layers of uh, graph paper or uh, tracing paper and then you can draw them out in layers so it's easier to uh, look at. So this is one of my designs I planted last year and you can see if I had just done the traditional design um, then you have a bubble circle for a tree uh, this whole area would have nothing underneath. So what I can do is basically having the big circle for the tree existing tree but then doing you could do a matrix design for under the tree and then you have the ground covered because if i only had the tree here there would be just bare dirt underneath and this is a mix of there's some diff two three different kind of sedges carex uh, species and then there's green and gold in between the idea is that you have the clump forming sedges and then the small short uh, uh, runner uh, green and gold will fill in the space in between. Um, now we're moving on to the case studies and uh, these are just a couple of examples I wanted to show you. Um, it is important, I can't emphasize it enough, the high important it is to plant the right plant for the place. Uh, this was a client, she contacted me and she wanted to have this uh, area planted. They redid the stonework and somebody did the planting for them and said they can't keep anything alive. Everything dies. It's really bad construction soil, clay, I've had rocks in it. There was not a lot of, it was really poor soil and they also had deer on the side. So uh, trying to do something with that and this is what it looked like by the end of the first season. So you can have a lush garden in any kind of soil. Uh, it might take time, maybe the plants will grow more slowly, but if you plant uh, things that will tolerate the soil that you have, you can have a nice garden. This is kind of end of the season. You can see there's a repetition of cone flowers. Here's a group, one group here. There's another one here. 
and uh, I have a lot of esters, obviously I'm all through almost a matrix of esters. And then there's some other plants and I had lamb deer on the side, just trying to keep the deer away. So I planted some aromatic uh, plants around. Uh, this one is a good example of uh, what to look at when you're trying to assess the side. In addition to looking at what plants to keep and what to get rid of, here there was a nice uh, kusa dogwood that we kept. Uh, this uh, laurel obviously it was not looking good. Uh, it drowned. Uh, there was some wa water issue at, that had to be fixed before we did the gardening. Uh, so that had to be solved. Uh, the laurels were removed. All the liriope from the vinca got removed. Uh, and the azaleas that you can see maybe that they're kind of yellowish, they're not looking very healthy. They got moved to the back garden where the soil was better. And uh, uh, the other problem was that the root flare for the tree was not showing. It does, it unfortunately doesn't show up on this, uh, in this picture, but uh, this is what it looked like afterwards before mulching, but uh, after the planting, um, because of the clay, so we planted things that will tolerate the clay and the uh, water, although the water problem was solved at the base of the house, you probably see that the grading got changed too, so we graded the soil away from the house. And those are good things to fix before planting, because it's much more difficult to do it after the plants are installed. Uh, this one, again, existing vegetation, used to be a formal vegetable garden. You can still see the garlic in the back, around the last bed, and lots of weeds. Um, unfortunately, uh, well, I didn't see what it looked like before, but uh, most of the weeds I could get before the seeds dropped, and they were all annual weeds or easy to remove weeds. Uh, there's a Rumax here, but most of the things are easy to take out. And this is what it looked like by probably midsummer. So the client wanted a lot of annuals for cut flower garden and butterflies. Uh, and, but I did plant some perennials, native perennials in the background. Uh, we had, and we had some salvia. And this was the garden that every time I visited, there were lots and lots of hummingbirds coming. That was just amazing. Every time I was there, there were probably like, three, four hummingbirds like fighting with each other for this spot. Uh, this was quite nice to see. Uh, this one, this was a unconventional front yard. Uh, I don't know how many years before I started working here, it was installed and it was unconventional in a way that it wasn't grass, but the way the plants were arranged was like really traditional. They, you can see there's a grouping of one kind of grass here. Uh, there's a grouping of Russian sage here. There is a grouping of a different kind of grass in the back. And then the only thing that actually looked really good this time of the year is pecker aura that was kind of in the shadiest, uh, most uh, wet area and it was doing great. But you can see that there's a lot of bare soil and certainly they don't look great in the winter. And because the plants were spaced so far apart and you can see the Russian sage, even if it grows, there's a lot of open space underneath where weeds love to grow um, here. So what we did is we filled in and pre-planted and same amount of plant and what was there originally fill in the space in between all these gaps. We planted hundreds of plants, plugs. And the other thing that we did to make it more acceptable for neighbors, and this is really important if you're doing something different, is to do uh, create uh, show cues of uh, to care. For example, here we have the fence put in. Uh, you could think of a bird bath or a sitting area. Anything that will show your know, passerbys that this is an intentional design, this is the way it's supposed to be, as opposed to something that's neglected, can help make it more acceptable uh, 
whatever, if, especially if you're doing uh, native plants that might not look the way people are used to. Uh, if you're doing a sitting area, make sure that it's something where you could actually sit down and it's not overgrown. Otherwise, you're getting the opposite idea. Um, but really, the having a fence or something that will show. The other thing that you can do is when you're designing with uh, native plants is pick shorter cultivars. You might like Joe Pie Bead, but it's too big for most uh, small yards. Um, especially you don't want to plant it right next to a sidewalk. You want to keep things shorter so people don't get uh, yeah, intimidated with the large plants. Uh, so use shorter cultivars. The other thing that you can do is cut the plants back uh, late spring, early summer. Uh, let's go to Chelsea cut. If you cut them back, they will bloom a little bit later, but they will still bloom. Uh, talking about all the late flowering plants like asters, goldenrods, but they will be shorter than what they would have been without cutting back. Uh, and it's really important to make sure that you have space and you're not overcrowding walkways because that's the sure way to get neighbors upset if they get they can't walk by and they might that might result in a letter to the township. Um, so you want to be nice to your neighbors and give them room to walk by. Uh, the other thing is really important is plan for maintenance and plan for change. Uh, I guess I should rather use uh, management instead of maintenance. We're not trying to keep the garden in the same way as it looked when we planted the things the first time. We're not keeping things small. Uh, we'd like to let them grow into whatever shape and form they want to be. But things change. For example, you have a lot of the black-eyed Susans here. There's actually a euonymus right here, if you can make it out. And then you have the really nice fox and the pine in the back. And as the pine gets bigger and the black ice season gets bigger, where is the flocks gonna go? It can't really move anywhere else. So it will get phased out unless the, in the management, you're planning on cutting back either the pine or the black ice season or both of them uh, to make room for the flocks. And then these uh, series of pictures were taken at our uh, meadow planting. It's just the front of our house. Uh, this is just one, something that I want to show you the seasonal changes so we can plan for how the plants uh, change over time during the course of a year, but also how from planting to mature garden. So this is what it looked like in June. And we planted, it was maybe four years or three, four years ago. Really late. We planted in like mid. <laughs> it was mid June, and my husband really enjoyed. We used the weed torch to kill the grass, so that was fun. Uh, but it was planted really late, and luckily we had a fairly rainy uh, summer, so it wasn't terrible. But most of the things were plugs, so they're really small plants, planted about a foot, foot and a half apart. And this is what it looked like two months later. So it's quite a lot of growth in a short amount of time. Uh, you can see that there's the grasses are getting big. Those are all side oat grammar grasses. You can see the rhythm, the repetition of the coneflowers here. Um, and things are filling in, but there's some bare soil, especially at the edges. And this is what it looked like in September. So you can see, I still have repetition. I still have rhythm, but it's different plants now. While the cornflowers are still there, uh, they're getting old and a little bit raggedy, uh, but this is the time for the golden rods to shine. Uh, I actually have three, four different kinds of golden rods. They look a little bit similar, uh, their form is similar to each other, but some of them are taller than others. So here's one that's a solar cascade. Uh, this is golden fleece here. And then I have uh, solidago rigida here. I don't think it's blooming yet. Uh, so you still have the same. So if you're you know, designing, you can think through the what plants will bloom in different times and you still want to have that same kind of rhythm uh, 
uh, throughout the year. And this is what it looked like really late in the season with the esters blooming, but surprisingly, cornflowers are still going. Uh, this is actually a Tennessee cornflower here in the front. Oops. Um, this one is a Tennessee cornflower, so it's a different one. It's not the purpura. Um, but it looks really full grown, just in, and this was all just taken in the first year of the planted in June, and this is in October. And this is what it looks like in the winter. And I purposely don't cut back the perennials. I like to look at the dead stalks. And apparently some other people <laughs> like to look at dead stalks too, because we had people walking by and they stopped and looked and they said, oh, it's quite neat. So as long as things are short, you can keep them. I probably wouldn't keep a Joe Pie weed or something similarly high close to the walkway because that can get floppy or some of the big grasses can get floppy. But as long as the plants are short, they can kind of look neat. And if you're looking closely, you can see some of the evergreen sedges here. There's one here, here, here. So those are the ground covering plants. Those are the supposedly 50% of the plants. Those are the, not the seasonal theme plants. Those are the workhorses. And if you look at it after being cut back, uh, they almost the showcasing plants because those are the plants that you can actually see this time after cutting back in March. Because everything else disappears and you would look at bare soil almost if you didn't have these ground covering plants. But here's lots of sedges. I have some penstemon. Uh, I have coral bells. I also had some wild strawberries that I can't really, that's probably here. Um, so you can see it's not quite 50%, but it's a pretty good amount is covered, covering the ground. So that means that weeds can not grow here or here or here. Weeds can grow only on the places where it's bare soil. So uh, the other benefit of having an intermingled planting is that even if you have weeds, you're less likely going to notice them or other people less likely will notice them. If you have a bed of mulch, anything that is not mulch will stand out. If you have an intermingled planting, if, like if I go back, can you tell any weeds there? Not so easily. I probably could pick on some, but there aren't, you can't see the weeds as well as if you have something that uh, is all the same and then anything different does stand out. And this is what it looks like in the spring. Um, a lot of texture, not a lot of color, at least not in this part of the bed at that time, but you can see the, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, coral bells have some color. They're looking good. These are the Dale strain coral bells, uh, the little texture. And there's just a lot of different textures. The sedges are looking great with all the new growth, but I have esters growing and the penstemons are coming up and everything else. And uh, all right, we are getting to the last section of the talk. So if you have any questions, you can start typing up. Uh, we, have hmm? we have two already. All right, good. We have two questions Three. already. Three. So start typing if you uh, like to. Uh, well, I'll try to answer everything. Uh, you have, but these are the couple of slides that I'm not trying to pick on every, anybody, but uh, these are the things that I thought might be helpful to look at. What are the things that we can avoid uh, uh, making mistakes? Uh, and I'll give you a couple of seconds or a minute to think about what are the things that you think are wrong with this? Uh, what are the things that are missing or something too much? Uh, how could you do differently? And if you go back and think of the beginning of the presentation with the elements of design and the principles of design, uh, you probably will find something that's not right. And so one thing that I'd like to show here is this is an inkberry. Behind that, there was another inkberry here. You can't really see it from the picture. And then there was one boxwood and there's another boxwood. This whole bed was about maybe seven foot 
long, 10 foot long and five foot wide, something like that. It's tiny. So you have four shrubs that require pruning to keep them in place. You have a couple of Amsonias here that are trying to grow out to get some more light. Obviously you have the Nepeta here. There's some ornamental grass and who knows what's underneath, right? Uh, so the problem is obviously there's, it's too crowded. It's also lacks unity. It's just like too many things too busy and you don't really know what to look at. Am I supposed to look at this rock? Oops, what did I do? Uh, am I supposed to look at this rock? Is that the focal point? Is it supposed to be these guys here? Can't really tell. So I've cleaned it out a little bit. And this was taken right after planting and transplanting. So it's probably not the best look. Uh, uh, but we also had some sedges under the, all those things and behind. So you can see there's, a, I think it's the Everest sedges in the back that we created some unity with that. Now you can tell that the focal point is this hydrangea tree. We also find some hellebores, which will be great after they get back to life after transplanting. Um, they will be nice for winter interest. And we had some, we ha still have the nepeta, a couple of nepetas here that will give uh, seasonal interest. But it's just clean out and it's more uniform, especially for, you can see it's right by the driveway, it's more of front yard. Uh, it looks a lot better in my mind. Um, here's the second one. Let's think about it. I'll give you a little bit of time to think of what's wrong with it. Let's see. So what I noticed first is that these plants these evergreens are huge and you can see there's a window right behind it. It's completely blocking the window. And I think there's a window here too that you can't even make out. Uh, so the plants are too big covering the window. They're also planted way too close to the house, um, which is not good for the plant or the house, I guess. Uh, generally, we want to have airflow between the plant and the structure. So the plants will not develop diseases. If there's a lot of moisture and lack of airflow, uh, just like with COVID-19, you want to have, you will have more likely problems and diseases if you don't have good air circulation. Um, you will have scales, you can have fungal diseases, you can have all different things if you don't have the space and you have too much moisture. And uh, these plants will be pretty too big at some point, and this one is already blocking that window behind. The other thing that's more of a design personal choice is uh, I don't like boxwoods. Boxwoods need dry summers, which we don't tend to have. So they have a lot of diseases. So I would not recommend planting boxwoods unless you have a good, well-drained soil and good air circulation. Uh, and I don't particularly like the mulch, as I said, because it just requires a lot of maintenance. But that's more of a personal preference. Being so close and blocking the window is more a design uh, issue. Um, so again, you can see, oh, sorry, uh, too close, blocking the window. And they also had some drainage issues because everything was sloping right to the house and uh, things were washing out right here, but you can't really see it from this picture. Um, next one, you can see, think about what you like, don't like, how would you fix it? And uh, so this one, there's really no focus. You have an unhealthy rhododendron. You have a huge grass here. They're kind of competing for attention. And then there's a lot of spreading uh, plant. There's some grasses that are weeds that were not cleaned out during maintenance. And then there are all these Solomon seal that I 
recommend not planting anything really tall spreading plant in front beds because they can look messy. Um, this is what it looked like after we uh, replanted and there's Bodergillas here, there's uh, Iteas, um, everything is small. Of course, this was just the first uh, year planting, but things that are more clump forming and smaller will do better uh, in the front if you're looking for a more formal look, for sure. Um, and then I think this might be the last slide, so type up your questions. <laughs> this one, it's actually my sister-in-law's <laughs> house that used to be it, like it was fixed since, but you can think about what it, uh, what you, you can criticize it, what you like, don't like about it. And uh, so here, if you look at the, I should have done a slide, but if you, oops, actually one more. But if you're looking at this side of the yard, the left side, it looks very different from the right side. So the right side is a formal garden with box with hedges, and I think it was pachysandra underneath and nothing else. And everything was clear. The left side was a nice rounded bed with all sorts of perennials and flowers, all onions that looked like really lush and green and just a very natural looking uh, planting here. So the two sides just don't match. Uh, and you can decide to like one or the other, but the two together just don't work. And then maybe this is the last one. Uh, well, if you look at it, I'll go quickly because I think we're running out of time. But this is basically the same thing as the previous slide. If you're looking at it, uh, one side has tall oak leaf hydrangeas that are getting too wide and they have to be trimmed to keep them away from the walkway. And you have clump forming uh, variegated liripe. On the other side, you have evergreen short growing shrubs with variegated uh, Solomon seal. So the variegated color goes in both sides, but unfortunately, these are clump forming thing here, and these are spreaders. So they just look very different. They have very different uh, spreading, and once they grow, uh, this side looks a little bit messier. Like either side could work on its own, but the two together just don't really work well. And uh, you could mix, if you don't have the salmon seal, you could mix some of these liripe, right, put it on the other side here, that would bring it together. So you can't, in general, you want to use repetition, not just within the same bed, but also, well, two sides of the bed, but also you could use some of the same plants in the front and in the back of your uh, backyard uh, to bring things together, to kind of make it look like it's one unit. Um, this one looks really different from one side. Oops. Uh, one and the other. So this one and that side, they just don't look like the same garden. And uh, just to think about, you don't have to fix your garden in one shot. Uh, just keep editing. Gardening is the slowest of the performing arts. Um, so it, we don't get it right the first time necessarily either, professionals. We try to get it as close as possible, but uh, you know, just work at it. Plants can be moved. Uh, trees more difficult than perennials, but perennials certainly you can transplant if you don't like the spot. Uh, you can edit your garden. It, it doesn't have to be done and it will never be done in one shot. You have to work at it and see and take a lot of pictures. Uh, if you're taking pictures in different time of the year, different seasons, just like what I showed you, you can see what's missing, what are the bare spots or areas where you need some more color, different time of the year. And it is difficult to take notes, but if you have pictures, you can mark the pictures and you can see, oh, I would like to add some more bulbs or daffodils from, for a certain location or things like that, that will really help you. Uh, over time, you can add and improve your garden uh, every year a little bit. And that's it. I have my contact information up. Um, if you like, like to send me a message, um, 
I can send you a list of books if you're interested in what books I like. And besides the, I guess I can run through it, the no maintenance, it's K-N-O-W is the, uh, that's the uh, Roy Diblex book with the, uh, oops, those are the ones that have the uh, mosaic uh, units. And Show then me, there's, Show me the, no, go ahead. No, go ahead. Um, uh, no maintenance, Maybe. perennial garden. The other one, oh, sorry. There, uh, planting a new perspective. This is a very nice book. This is the one that has like the really complicated designs, uh, but it's a great read. Um, then the, Probably most of you are familiar with the uh, Doc Tellamy's books. Uh, this is one of them. I don't know how many he has, like three, four, five, is The Living Landscape. That's a nice book. Uh, and then for design, uh, Planting in the Post-Wild World. It's a little depressing title, but the book is really good and not that depressing. Um, uh, that's also has none of these other than Ptolemy's book. They're not specific for native plants, but they give you good ideas. And then I recommend having other books that you can find information about plants, what kind of conditions they grow in the wild. So if you're trying to plant things that match them with their condition where they naturally occur is the most likely will get you success. So this is a wild, uh, a wildflowers and plant communities in Southern Appalachian and Piedmont, and there's native plants of the Northeast, and there's many others, but these are the ones that I just thought that might be helpful. And some of them might you might be able to find at the library once the libraries are open. Uh, certainly Amazon has them. Hopefully you can find them locally soon enough. Questions? All right. All right. So first from Holly. When thinking about width and planting spacing, is it okay to start with plants closer together and plan to move them later? Uh, very good question. You could, as long as you follow through. You can plant them close and then you have to remember to move them. Uh, actually for like large plantings, like thinking of arboretum parks, they, uh, plan them so that they plan to take some of them out. So they might, if you're wondering how people plan this big estate, they might be planting a lot of trees and some of them are fast growing, some of them are slow growing. And while the fast growing trees might grow and shelter the other trees, and then eventually some of the trees will be taken out. Uh, or if you want, you can fill in the space with perennials and Larry Wiener, a landscape architect, does that. Uh, he uses that method that he fills in the space with filler plants, essentially, short lived uh, plants, a lot of uh, Rudbeckia herta, I think, and others. Uh, so the space is filled with perennials that gives you instant color, uh, instant gratification. And as the bushes get bigger, the perennials get phased out, basically squeezed out of the space. But you have a full garden even before the plants get big. Next. All right, great. Beth asks, are you strict about putting in natives or do you also use nativars and cultivars? Um, it's a good question again. Uh, some of the, it's uh, difficult to find the original source for the plants. It's difficult to find the dig down to what the actual plant is. If you're looking at cultivars, a lot of times the names, uh, there might be a cultivar that's a naturally occurring variation of that plant. And in that case, it's just a native plant, just any other plant. It was just found in a particular area. Uh, and I don't have a problem with that. Sometimes cultivars might be hybrids, like we have the heucarolas, which are the hybrids between the foam flowers and the coral bells. Um, I'm not super strict about uh, using cultivars or not. I think cultivars are a good option for planting uh, smaller things, especially for small yards. Uh, if you're doing a restoration, you would want to do as many of the species as possible because 
you want to have the genetic variation, but for a home garden, it's not necessary. One note, the warning, I guess, is that if you're planting orange coneflower, rather fancy newer cultivars of coneflowers, uh, the seedlings will just look like any other coneflower. So if you want to have keep your orange coneflowers, uh, you might get disappointed because maybe the original orange plant dies at some point and you will have a lot of seedlings and you wonder why my cornflowers are pink now and I planted orange ones. Uh, I actually happen to like, I planted two different cultivar cornflowers and I enjoyed it. Lots of variations of colors, shapes, sizes, all different things that are coming up from seeds. But if you designed for orange and that's what you want, that might be a disappointment. Okay, another one from Beth. What is your maintenance strategy for the meadow area in terms of weeding and keeping it suitable for the lawn? It involves the children. And <laughs> being, but. The meadow, I weed it when I think of it. It's usually two, three times a year. Uh, or just weed the edges where I see the weeds and don't go inside. Uh, I cut it back usually in the spring, sometime in March. Uh, when I cut it back, a lot of times I just break up or chop up the stalks and let it drop wherever it, uh, it goes. So basically that's what I, the mulch is that I use for it. I mean, for big scale, there are machines that will chop it up for you much faster than I can do, but I don't have that scale. Um, and I don't mulch it and I don't do anything. I don't water. That's basically it. So maybe weeding three times and chopping it back in the spring. That's it. Okay, so a um, couple, two questions about, I'm going to get this wrong, Pacara Aurea? Yes. Pacara Aurea. So Diane asked, please say again what to plant to block celadon. Yeah. Beth jumped in and said Pacara Aurea. And yeah. then Helen asked, I have an area with PA Carex mm -hmm. and Asclepia tuberosa. Mm -hmm but a lot of space in between getting pretty weedy. Is there another plant you would recommend to in intersperse there? So I guess the question- I think it's Celadon, yeah. Pacara so, Aurea, and the other stuff. Yeah. Like so the pa Pacara, it goes back to what kind of site conditions you have. Celandine likes moist conditions. Pacara also likes that. I mean, they can grow in normal general garden soil, but they really like the weather side. Uh, so Pecora could outcompete, and I know this. I don't have a lot of Sunday in, in the uh, Golden Ragbird feed, a Pecora, uh, and there's not much in uh, Marion Botanical Park across from us either. So it's just like some of the plants have much wider uh, tolerance than others. If you find a sweet spot or as close as possible, they will be healthier and more vigorous so they can grow better and outcompete uh, plants. If you plant them at their edge of their tolerance, then they're not going to like it as much and they're more likely to have weeds growing. Um, so for the second question, when the weeds between the, uh, or the butterfly weed, uh, if you have a butterfly weed likes dry soil, sandy or like really loose, uh, well-drained soil. So if you have that, you could do other things that are not necessary. And uh, butterfly weed likes to grow on edges. So it would not be a good plant in the middle of the field. They don't, they're do not not the best competitors. So probably outcompeted or over, you know, shadowed with the cornflower would not be a good thing. You could maybe plant some, uh, I really like the Amsonia blue ice is a really nice plant if you have enough moisture. Uh, other one, uh, uh, Amsonia, A-M-S-O, uh, blue ice. Blue. Uh, it's a great plant ice. for part shade also. Uh, the other one is the Monarda bradburiana. So the bee balm, that's a native species uh, bee balm. I'm not sure about the common name, but that's one of the shorter ones and it spreads, but it doesn't take over. Uh, that's a nice one. It, it does keep the leaves green in the winter too. There's covers the ground enough that it's present. Um, that might be a good one. Um, I think that's, hopefully that helped. 
All right, so one more question from Faye, and then we're going to wrap it up. If you have planted perennials, such as Amsonia, which I just learned to spell right now, are, and you are waiting for them to fill in, how about planting annuals to fill in the empty spaces? That could work. Um, as I said, Larry Wiener uses annuals to fill in between shrubs. You can use the same thing uh, to fill in the space. It's better than having mulch. Um, uh, you could use annuals, just annual, non-native annuals. You can try to use native annuals or short-lived plants. Uh, anything that covers the ground. Uh, if you have big Amsonias, the Amsonia hubertii, you might want to do something other than just annual because even though they're big plants, their legs are bare. Uh, so you probably want to, and then sedges are great for filling in the space or even the coral balls, uh, anything that will stay uh, low and evergreen preferably would fill in the space and uh, help you fight the weeds so you don't have to do the mulching. Is that, yeah? All right. All right. Thank you very much well, for joining us. And thank you, Orshi, for um, here. Hold on. Let's do this. Do, 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 do. All right. So thanks everyone. Wow, it's for a lot of people us. today. <laughs> yeah. Thanks everyone for joining us, Orshi. Thanks very much. It was I learned to spell. Thank you very much. <laughs> here and I'm gonna quickly unmute everybody if you wanna. I don't know how to actually I can't do unmute. Oh wait. wait maybe on, you can on, unmute yourself. Nope, hold on. Unmute no, hold on. <laughs> you can unmute yourselves too. Yep. Yeah. Way to go. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Thank hey, you. Hey, 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 this is why we have a library because it's a huge resource for the community. Please help contribute to your library. That's This is what your library does for you. All right, take care, and everybody. All, and all the good books are purchased from your donation money. So yep. if you want to see great books, and I can give the library my list of favorite books, and if they don't have it, maybe they can purchase some of them. But uh, please donate to your library so we can have these great books available for everybody. Stay safe, everyone. We'll see you soon. We're going to do it again. Promise. You too. Thanks.